I'm here with Jonathan Ross, the CEO of AI chip startup Grok. Jonathan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So tell us, uh, just at a very high level, what does Grok do? So we build the LPU. You've heard of the GPU, but the LPU is a language processing unit. And the difference is GPUs are built for highly parallel programs. Things where you can do a lot of tasks at the same time, but they're not sequential. They don't rely on each other. So LPUs are good, for example, with language because you can't predict the 100th word until you've predicted the 99th. And so it's completely unique, but super fast. And um, typically when we show people a demo for the first time, the response is, wow. So actually our, uh, our website URL, it's not www.grok.com. It's actually www.grok.com. Can you explain inference to, to a layman and uh, what does that mean for a regular person who's using AI? So every time you go to uh, one of these chatbot websites and you type in a query and you hit enter, the result that comes back is inference. And the difference between that and what you'll typically hear about training is that, um, let's use an analogy, if a doctor or someone wants to become a um, cardiologist or let's say a cardio surgeon, you spent a lot of years in school learning how to do that. That's the training, just like the word sounds, right? But inference is sort of like performing the surgery, going in there and doing it. Now, training is expensive, but it's nowhere near as expensive as inference. And this is one of the things that catches almost everyone off guard. So I remember at Google, we had actually trained the world's best speech recognition model, and uh, we just couldn't afford to put it into production. So we actually built the TPU in order to get that um, uh, speed up, the performance, the amount of compute needed to put it into production. And just think about it this way. When you're training a model, it scales with the number of AI researchers you have. There aren't too many of those in the world. When you're doing inference, it scales with the number of end users you have. And I think as Sam Altman put it, um, inference is eye-wateringly expensive. So we're here to make it cheaper, faster, and more available for everyone. And so you've made your bet on faster inference. Uh, why is that important? And, and how does it show up for a regular person? It's a little bit like asking, why do people like fast sports cars? They just do. So uh, that's why we put our website up, so you could just go there and try it. And it's fun watching people try, like the comments that they make, they just, it comes out so fast. There's this visceral feeling. And there were all these studies at Google about speed. Um, there were studies where they would actually imperceptibly slow down search to the point where you do an A-B test and you actually couldn't, as a human being, say this one was faster than that one. But the one that was faster, people used more of, a lot more. And so even when we can't consciously say this one is faster or this one's faster, we use more of whatever's faster. And if you think about it, the last time that you, you opened up an app and it just responded really slowly, and you're just sitting there waiting for the answer and your mind drifts. And then finally it, you get the answer and you, you're, you've totally lost your train of thought. That's why human beings want answers quickly. It allows them to stay in flow and they get a lot more done. And as AI continues to advance, what are some of the things that become possible because of faster inference? Well, um, one of the big ones is agentic use cases. So we're used to going to the chatbots now and, and typing in a query and getting an answer. But that's a single step. Instead, suppose that you want to book a, a ticket um, to, I don't know, where's a good place to vacation? Hawaii. Hawaii, okay. So you want to book a, a trip to Hawaii. So you type in, book me a trip to Hawaii. Well, it then needs to ask, where in Hawaii? Uh, do you want to sit on the beach? Do you want to do it? So it has to ask a bunch of questions. And once it's got all the answers to that, it then has to go and figure out which airline to book, which hotel to get for you. Some of them are going to be full, some of them won't. So think about all of the tasks that you have to do to uh, accomplish something. Those are agentic uh, workloads. And you can't actually solve it until you've done all of these iterations. And so the longer it takes to get an answer, the more that compounds. So we actually had one customer who built a agentic workload. This is someone who has over 1 billion users. 
and it was taking them four to five minutes to actually get a result. And when they switched to Grok, they actually got it down to 10 seconds. I think when people think about AI chips, you know, the, the household name uh, that comes to mind is NVIDIA. Mm. Um, how are your chips different from NVIDIA? Well, NVIDIA builds what are called GPUs, graphics processing units. We build what we call LPUs, or language processing units. GPUs are very good at parallel processing. So imagine that you wanted to complete some sort of task, like um, filing your taxes. Well, just imagine that you could give each page of that to someone else to fill in. That would be what a GPU does. But if you want to write a story, you need a coherent arc. You need to know the beginning, the end, and everything's going to depend on what else happens. For that, you probably need an LPU because it's sequential. You can't actually predict the 99th or the 100th word until you predicted the 99th. That sequential component is something that GPUs can't do, but LPUs like these are very good at. And so there's NVIDIA, there's AMD, Intel, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the legacy companies, and there are also other chip startups um, like Samba Nova and, and Cerebrus. How do you fit into that ecosystem, and, and how do you compete with those other players? Well, one of the main things that we do is we actually make our chips available through a service, Grok Cloud. Um, and if you go there, you can actually just try it out. It's super fast. And then we have an API that allows people to build their own applications on top of it. So we don't require that you buy these uh, servers and put them in data centers yourself. We handle all that for you. It makes it super easy. In fact, in the last, um, I think, about 14 weeks, we've gone from fewer than seven developers to over 260,000 developers. And that's because we made it super easy. You don't have to do much work. You just go there. Uh, the API actually matches OpenAI's API. So your existing code already works. So you've been at this for a while. You started in 2016, um, and then all of a sudden, November 2022, ChatGPT comes out, and you know the world kind of discovers generative AI. How has your your business changed since then? Oh, it's it's totally transformed things for us. Uh, it's funny because uh, we actually thought we were we were going to run out of money. We thought we were going to die. The thing is, what we had built, we had built it a little too early. Um, people didn't need performance, uh, performance inference until LLMs came out. So all of those um, image classification models and, and the like, they were running fast enough that it didn't matter. But because you have to string all those words together, each word that's computed, the amount of time that it takes compounds. So if you want to get 600 words out and it takes you two milliseconds each, that's 12 seconds. Just imagine if you went to Google and you typed a query and you hit enter and it took 12 seconds to get an answer, that'd be unusable. So when these LLMs came out, it made it very easy for people to viscerally get a sense of how fast our hardware was and it mattered. Roughly every 100 milliseconds of latency improvement is roughly an 8% increase in engagement. But we didn't improve things by 100 milliseconds. We took it from 10 seconds down to one second, which is 90 compoundings of 8%. We actually spent the first six months at Grok working on the compiler before we ever started designing a chip. And as far as we know, we're the only people who've ever done that. Typically, chips are designed by um, hardware engineers and hardware architects. And so they start with the chip and then they figure out the software later. This was a little bit like having a driver design a car and then it caused all sorts of headaches in terms of how do we like fit the engine into this weird thing because it wasn't what a mechanic would design. It wasn't what a hardware engineer would design, but it actually works much better for the end user. And when Llama 3 came out, we were actually able to get into production the same day that it was released, even though it had not targeted our architecture. So what do you think your biggest challenges are going forward? So the biggest challenge is deploying more hardware. Um, as we were talking about, uh, we have uh, over 200 racks in production now, and we have to get to about 1,300 by the end of the year. So that's 200 to 1,300. And so everything that we're doing is about scaling, and if we were able to do that, that 1,300 racks will actually put us at the same amount of capacity as um, uh, one of the largest hyperscalers at the end of 2023 had. So that'll put us in the same running and same um, scale as a hyperscaler. So you guys are not the only Grok around. Uh, Elon Musk has a chatbot called Grok. Um, has that led to any confusion? A little bit, and um, I'll just put it this way. We call dibs. 
We, we own the trademark, we call it dibs. You said something really interesting, compute is the new oil. Can yeah. you go into that a little bit more? What, what does that mean? The way to think about it is every technological age is based on something, some sort of scarce resource. The industrial age was built on oil, coal, natural gas, now solar, wind, but energy. Um, the information age started off with the printing press and eventually we got to the internet and mobile. And so a question that I used to get when we were fundraising was, uh, is AI going to be the next internet? Is it gonna be the next mobile? My answer is absolutely not because those are information age technologies. This is a generative age technology. It's different because whereas information age technologies are about copying data with high fidelity and replicating it and distributing it, generative age technologies are about creating something new in the moment, in the context of the question that's being asked. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for, for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it.